going to try and work out how to put this back on now. I can only really disappoint, can't I, after that? <laughs> so, so I'm really, really sorry. It will be disappointing. And the last time I spoke about joy was after doing a big public lecture called Is Anything Beyond Capitalism? And all I could think of at the end was joy and wonder. So uh, this isn't going to be as critical, but it's pretty critical. I think you're just waiting for that. We're waiting for it to warm up. So I did feel uh, this was an incredible challenge um, because I'm from the north and wanted to move back to the north and have been working with the global elite for the last two years, which is quite an experience, um, that I really, really wanted to come back to actually do something more locally based. And so for me, it's an absolute treat to be delighted to, to be invited here and to actually connect to people who are doing things, because I know you're all doing amazing things. I've been kind of checking things out through Imogen, and it's really, really inspiring. So I'll do a critique, and I'm hoping that you'll come up with the solutions <laughs> where to find the love and the kindness. But I think I'm quite suspicious, and that's the problem, because I often take a long historical analysis of particular relationships, and what we find are phenomenal repetitions. And I think it's being really, really conscious of those repetitions and how we're invested in them, not because we want to be, not through our own voluntary volition, but because we are socially positioned. So those positions become critical, and that's why I'm a sociologist. So we do make history, as Mark said, but not in the conditions of our own choosing. And it's those conditions that I'm going to think about. As soon as we can get this up and running, can any, anybody know how to... It was all working before we practised. Is it coming up? Great. So I'm going to run through, and I'm very nervous now after that uh, introduction, um, I'm going to run through uh, the challenge that I think Andy gave me, which was, uh, what is society? How can we love it? And uh, these, for me, are the key questions. What is it? If we say society does, what do we mean? Who in society? For me, the absolute key question, and the reason I am a sociologist still, is in whose interests? And that's what I study. Interests and their institutionalisation. So what is it for and why? And we can't do this without understanding power. So this is when I got really absorbed and wrote a whole different lecture. And you didn't need a lecture, <laughs> but trying to work out how to understand society. So for me, it's, it's based on the model of what anthropologists call parts and wholes. There's lots of parts and the wholes stick together. So we know that these little parts make up nations, but nations don't just exist as wholes. Nations are also parts. They're assisting hierarchical system and these parts all attribute to value so my focus is really on value and values and what's key in the work that I do with Jason and, and Kate is how we cannot understand the economy in any way unless we understand morality all economic choices are moral choices who has value? How do they have value? How do they gain value? How do they lose value? How do we understand value? So for me, it's, love is about value as well as everything else. It's not just pure intimacy. It's about how we connect to people through relationships of value. So the nation and its parts exist within a bigger whole, global capitalism. And global capitalism that literally shapes all our lives, in particular, as everybody knows, through austerity, because you've been working a lot on that, um, actually looks for value all the time. It's what we call at the moment a dig and gig economy. It's an extractive, and at the moment the new monopoly capitalists are all data. Uh, you know, Facebook, the, the fangs as they're called, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, etc. Um, so dig and gig is our current conditions rather than care and repair, and that's key. Um, so the search for economic value is a way of working out who has value in that system. How do they work? Who gets exploited? Who makes the value? How is it attributed? But global capitalism also attributes value to nations. So inserts itself into the parts and the nations attribute value into the institutions and the institutions attribute value 
into the social relations that we all inhabit and exist within. Is that clear? We've got different parts all connecting and they get bigger and they get smaller. And they're all about value. So who are the people? And this is kind of key. For a long, long time, and this is why I want to go back to history, for a long, long time, we just had individuals and masses. Feudal society, the origins of capitalism. So we had only two parts <coughs> which existed in nations. The individuals were property-owning, franchised with power, and they were European colonial white because they were European and mainly men. The mass were the rest, and they were known as the mass because their only value was as labour. They were slaves, they produced labour, they produced value, or they were peasants. Now, interestingly, and this is why I want to express caution, a lot of social theory is also based on this model. So you'll read a huge amount of early social theory when sociology started, and it's all about talking about individuals who did things and were adventurous, and the mass who laboured, basically. And sometimes they're really troublesome. There's brilliant books about troublesome mass, like the many-headed hydra, and how the mass keep rebelling. But the mass were also morally defined. They were ungovernable, they were contagious, they were dirty, they were violent, they were drunk, they couldn't look after themselves, uh, and they were always a problem. The mass, and this is crucial, were considered not to have selves. They didn't have a self at all. Only individuals had selves, and only individuals had interiority. The mass were just the mass. And through this, we learn that some people could extract value and some people could only be exploited. And they're still crucial relationships. At the moment, we're in a situation where we have huge surplus populations in the West. Massive surplus populations. Nobody knows what to do with them because their value uh, is not worth having anymore. Labour can be so cheap that it's actually not worth employing them, hence the crisis in the welfare state. So the categories of class come into existence through individuals, the Reform Act, and then the, through <coughs> the working class through the poor law. But as E.P. Thompson's most brilliant book shows, the working class didn't even know themselves as the working class. They had to learn to recognise themselves as such. The mass had to take on a classificatory form. So those forms, symbolic forms, come into existence to start challenging the mass and the individuals. But still, the mass and the class don't have subjectivity, interiority, and selves. It's really, really important. We have what Foucault defines in his huge historical studies, four particular discourses that define the mass. And one is dangerous outcast, the urban mass, the revolutionary age, alien, the contagious woman, and the non-recuperable. So now I'm going to go into the non-recuperable. Um, we have, alongside all these categorizations, a discourse or a theory of monstrosity. Now, there's a whole history that can be written about this because the state, the British state, and the first private company that invested in slavery um, <clears throat> actually were the people who came up with a theory of monstrosity. Francis Bacon was the chancellor, uh, who also was one of the chairs of the Virginia company that built all the slave colonies in the US. And they had a theory of monstrosity. And this was to give the mass that had become a class a particular degenerate classification. They were problematic. Monstrosity was used to define racism, classism, sexism. Absolutely used to say that certain categories are degenerate. And it was used to do all sorts of terrible things, to claim all the common land, to ship people off to build slave colonies and to kill them. They were branded, and there's, there's huge histories written on this, so I'm not going to go into all that. But in particular, women became symbolically uh, the, the symbol of the dangerous, contagious, and ungovernable. 
the fecund woman, the woman who breeds, the woman who's excessive, the woman who can't be controlled, and hence we have the witch hunts. That's another 16 or so books. If you want to watch this kind of history, and, and part of it that's really significant, I'm moving now uh, into the 18th century, and what we get is the significance of Christianity. So we've had these discourses, we've had the mass becoming a class, we've had degeneracy, being attributed to them, we now get women highlighted in two very different ways. Middle class women are given some individuality. Those who own property can have individuality. Read all the Trollope novels and things like that. They have an individuality and they're allowed, middle class women are allowed to go out and evangelise working class women into morality. So middle class women get their freedom from the oppressive family patriarchal structure by going out evangelizing. There's some incredible stories about the, the first uh, history of social work. History of social work comes from Christian evangelizing by middle class women who go out and tell working class women what to do in order to become governable. And the working class women are given responsibility for controlling their husbands. That's also another story. So women become responsible for the moral state of the nation. And I, I really do recommend watching this programme called The Crimson Petal by the BBC, or reading the novel, even better, uh, which is all about Mrs Fox, uh, who is full of angst and psychological distress and family injury, who goes out to evangelise... Um, I've forgotten her name now. <coughs> Sugar. Sugar, who's a sex worker, uh, but Sugar's having a great time. <laughs> That's also another story. Um, and so class always, the mass, the class always has a relationship. It's a social relationship where one gains freedom at the expense of the other. One gains value through the exploitation of the other. And what we have during this period, and the historians here will be shaking in their boots because it's whipping through such history, but there are lots of things to read behind this. Traces, Carolyn Steedman's brilliant work, traces how a working class self, the idea that the working class could have a self, could even be individuals, have an individuality, have interiority, interiority came into existence. And again, through religion, through the poor law, through welfare. If you wanted to receive welfare, you had to tell a story of yourself as redemptive. I was bad, now I'm good. And unless you promised to be good, you wouldn't get any welfare through the poor law. And she does all the archives on the telling, how people were forced to tell themselves through the poor law. She goes through all the legal and historical archives and looks at how that discourse of telling came into effect. People had to tell themselves through Christian evangelical discourse. I was a very, very bad person. I did this, but now I will be good. And redemption's absolutely critical. Telling oneself to the welfare authority in order to get money by saying you will become good because you were bad, and that you need transformation is critical. And you'll see this happening. I'm quickly going to introduce this. It's a very old book, so I'm not going to promote it or anything. Just to say it was a longitudinal ethnographic study with 83 white working class women who were also, I realised through the study, doing caring courses at a FE college, positioned symbolically without any value. They were ungovernable. That's the way they were talked about. They were seen to be in need of transformation and they were symbolically positioned all the time as a problem uh, by education, welfare, law and media. All their cultural dispositions, being noisy, having a laugh, having lots of sex, were seen as pathological, an individual problem. The individuality that was attributed to them was in attributed as a pathology, as something that was internally wrong with them, not the fact they'd been socially positioned as uh, those were their possibilities. I realised that over time, their sense of self, and it was an 11-year study, their sense of self came through defence. They had a defensive identity. 
That's all they could do was continually defend themselves against anticipated judgments of lack of value. They defended, defended, defended. And I realised over time how horrific it is, and I actually started understanding my mother, how horrific it is to live in a position of continual defence, where you anticipate your every move is you're going to be judged as lacking and not having any value, and that you come up against that all the time, through education, through law, through welfare, through practically every encounter they had with middle class subjects. So they were not, and I've written a whole thing, a whole book on uh, class, self and culture, they were not subjects of value. When they're finally, they have a subjectivity, they're attributed with individuality, but it's an individuality without value, always assumed to be problematic. But they challenged it. And the book is a story of how they challenged it, because they challenged it by becoming even more morally superior. They challenged it through motherhood primarily, and what we see in all the studies I've done since is that motherhood is incredibly significant for working class women to say, I actually care about my children, you send yours away, you let other people look after you. And all the really good studies on motherhood, Imogen Tyler, Steph Lawler, are all about that claiming uh, moral superiority in the sight of devaluation. And that's crucial, because as motherhood becomes increasingly scrutinised in its every single tiny granular practice, one of the only sources of value is also becoming subject to more and more critique and intervention. Caring was key. They wanted to be caring. And I think what we know from loads and loads of research internationally is that people want to care they're often just not given the conditions to do so. Um, I'm just going to let you read that for a minute. I'm going to have a... And this is about people wanting to have a good life, but always judged as lacking. This was from another project, and this was a project with um, ex-offenders. Again, I was interested in people who couldn't invest in becoming a proper good subject to value and how they lived it. They were on a, a programme at Goldsmiths College, Goldsmiths University of London, doing open learning. So they were so incredibly acutely aware of their social positions. Phenomenal. When I sent the paper off to be reviewed by an academic journal, people thought I'd made it up because the comments were so articulate. So they're very, very, very acutely aware of what's going on. So why weren't they subjects of legitimate value? And that's because historically, subjects of value, the legitimate self, has always been middle class. And even the sociology of it is middle class. Um, and that is... We look at all the theories of the self in sociology and they are aesthetic, prosthetic, experimental, enterprising, reflexive or cultural omnivore selves and they're all about future exchange. They're all about selves that accumulate value to themselves, economic, cultural, social, <coughs> symbolic. They're always accumulating. And there's some, again, lovely research projects that show how much horror and effort middle-class mums have to put into driving their children around to ballet, violin, uh, horse riding, everything. And they have to do that or their children will lose out. It's a childhood of accumulation. It's a childhood of adding value. It's a childhood of anticipated future exchange. That's very, 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 very different to working-class children. Very different. And even the theories of how social, relation, social relations are shaped by sociologists talk about this utilitarian, calculating. I always wondered what calculating hedonism was. It's like it's a contradiction in terms, but it does mean you only have two glasses of champagne instead of the whole bottle. Um, but exchange value is central to the formation of themselves. This is so different to the working class who do not have access to all this cultural capital. The first time I went to a museum, I was 18, I had no idea what you do. I still don't know what you do in art galleries. It's like you haven't got the how knowledge. 
you know you should be there, you know you should be generating value, you know you're meant to do this stuff because you've been to university, but you don't know how to do it. You don't have what Bourdieu calls the epistemology of experience. You haven't a clue what to do. And I think that's why you always get caught out. And in the Formations book, the women are always being caught out when they even try and pass. And I'd say even as a professor, probably, you know, a, a very high level professor, I'm always being caught out. And the House of Lords, somebody thought I was the tea lady. So, you know, it never <laughs> stops. <laughs> Seriously, seriously, I was there to get an award and I'm making the tea. Um, it's just because I open my mouth and you can hear my accent, so that's quite significant. And really valued selves, so we don't not just have sociologists, social theorists, understanding society through the accumulative exchange value self, we also have the IMF and the World Bank. These are the institutions of global capital that say how nations should behave who actually are used through tons and tons of international research to shape how they apply for funding in development programs. We have the IMF and we have the World Bank saying a subject of value, and they use that term, that's where I got it from in the 1990s. A subject of value is a particular type of individualistic competitive, you have to be competitive and you have to be risk-taking, enterprising self. It's the identical self to Mr. Homo economicus, the one that economics uh, has used for years to model our economic system that is actual bullshit. It is just complete bullshit. It's about a rational acting man who works in his own interests. And we all know now with data science that it really doesn't work like that. The interesting thing about data science is predictive data shows that people aren't rational. And Angus Deaton, who's running the new Inequality Commission, won an award for saying that economics isn't just about self-interest. Huh? Just read history books, it's really obvious. The most scary thing that's going on at the moment, and I think we will get, is the Chinese social credit system. Has anybody heard about it? Yeah, really, really scary. The Chinese government is giving everybody an exchange value. Um, so really, really look at that. And it's whether they're law-abiding, pay their bills, how they perform at work and at school. Every aspect of life is going to be controlled. It, I mean, we all know now, because the other thing I study is digital tracking, we all know now that everything you look at on your browser is subject to knowledge. So, you know, when I was, when I was doing that, no, I won't go off on that story, but uh, that's going to be really, really critical because everything you do is going to be subject to evaluation. But I'm going to really, really quickly go this, through this project because this exemplifies, if you think about the very early debates, think about the formation of class and mass, think about women being the figure of the abject, excessive, transformative per person in need of transformation, women being the focus, motherhood being the real focus, let's look at reality TV. And I always say, I did this. <laughs> I did this so you didn't have to. It's horrific. It was the worst experience of doing a research project. Um, I mean, I, got, I did it because I was very angry at watching Wife Swap in 2003, because it was just about humiliation. And during the duration of the project, it got worse and worse and worse. We got Jeremy Kyle, that now everybody knows about. But it was just awful. It was like three years of watching humiliation. So this is a project, but also it works with uh, audiences. So the story isn't completely grim. But I want to just draw your attention to one of our middle class uh, audience groups and one of the subjects and how Ruby adds value to herself all the time before we go through the rest. So Ruby is your quintessential middle class subject. Everything she does is about her future. Social network, she's totally connected everything she does. The TV program she watches, everything. And some of the audience studies are really, really funny because it's about middle class mums hiding the television and pretending they didn't watch it. But they do. <laughs> so we have a paper called 
I'm really not watching reality. Goodness, I'm really not watching reality TV. But that's very different to what I'm going to show you, which is about the working class mums being made abject, like Imogen show, and how the symbolic economy works through television. One of the most important mechanisms, institutions of society. In fact, so important that that is how we often know what society is, who other people are, and how we recognise them. So I'm doing this very quickly. You'll all know this, massive change. Thatcherism, shifting values to the spectacles of the undeserving. Began with bread, if you remember that. But interestingly, at the time, there was a really good programme called Boys in the Black Stuff running at the same time in the same city. So you can see there's a whole battle going on. And then we have Cathy Come Home to Pram Face to Vogue. So we did have programmes that actually encapsulated dignity to complete appropriation. We then get into alternative comedy. Alternative for whom? We've got to ask, which then kind of culminates in, and I have to say the comedy is brilliant. You know, you traded one of your kids for a, a, a what's it video, a take that video, really. <laughs> so, you know, you can imagine it's, it's cutting edge comedy, but it's horrific. What's also really interesting in this, think about the race. It's the fecundity, all the children, and mixed race. Race starts entering as the category, remember from Victorian times when it was all about degeneracy, racism, sexism, and uh, racism, which ones have I forgotten? All of them mixed together, class, race, and gender, all mixed together as degenerate is happening again. And then this culminates in Benefit Street which I'm sure you know, but what's really significant is how Benefit Street, and I need to skip through to another slide, how Benefit Street informed the DWP policies. Now, I'm going to show that story very quickly, but before I do, I'm going to use a controversial slide because one of our major findings from this project is how the discourse of psychology has replaced the discourse of religion. So where it used to be Christian evangelicals who told working class women they were bad, needing improvement, were excessive, now it's psychology and it's their fault. They're not told, they have to tell themselves. So it's like the logical stage of all that telling the self. You have to find your badness and make good. And that's the whole entertainment of reality TV transformation programmes transformation programs in particular. You tell your badness, you tell how excessive you are, and the telling of how bad you are gains value for you as a participant. And I'm not just saying that, we, we watched them. We did a, a huge narrative analysis of them. So telling oneself is really, really, really key. And what's key in all of these programs, the social disappears. The social is eradicated. It's all about the individual and it's never about their social conditions. So living in really, really hard circumstances is a problem of the self. It gets internalised. And what's also key is the audience learns to judge morally. These programmes are repeated so much, they're historically building on traditions, they're repeated across a huge range. Reality TV extends into lots of other forms not just uh, reality TV itself. Newsnight has a reality TV section. I mean, it, it extends all over. We get Donald Trump. That's kind of, you know, the logic of the extension of reality TV. Um, and we get huge judgment by audiences. Judgment of how people tell themselves. So this is the classic example from Wife Swap that outraged me at the beginning. These people are judged as having lack of value because of how much they eat. And they're set up to show themselves as spectacularly bad. And we're expected as the audience to judge them. And every part of their body is subject to scrutiny. So if they're large, that's because they haven't done self-care rather than access to food or their choice. If they have a suntan, that's because they're excessive. They're often very loud and they often have lots of children. And they're particularly chosen to make spectacular all those forms uh, of bodily practice. And when everybody wants to say people have lots of agency and whatever, we showed how the audience is totally manipulated. 
And interestingly, right across all our different groups, they all got outraged at the same thing. They all did affect, the dog go, <gasps> so we listened through all the tapes and they're all doing it at the same point. So certain things would make people go, <gasps> but it's the way they then translate the <gasps> into moral judgment. And it's always, <gasps> oh my God, and that's always what happens. Watch yourself when you're watching these, you'll go, <gasps> Oh my God, <laughs> I don't do that usually. But not always, and I'm going to come to that. But I just want to point this out. If you don't know this story, you should. Uh, the Department of Work and Pensions used A4E to promote people back to work. Not in, a in areas where there were no jobs. There was one programme of uh, A4E informed uh, fairy godmother. Fairy godmother? Anyway, uh, <laughs> I've forgotten the name of it. Uh, one of the programmes that is a back-to-work programme. There's loads of them. And the woman who ran A4E actually stole all the government's money. She took 8.6 million initially. Then she had a salary of 365,000. Then she paid herself and her husband another 1.7 million. She was never prosecuted. She resigned and four of her employees were prosecuted. These were the people who made up performance targets of getting people back to work in areas where there were no jobs. Um, and we do know there's huge research now on uh, poverty porn produced by poverty pimps, as in all of these programmes are a factory of self-performance, um, and where we, the audience, are asked to decide who's eligible, who should get a job, who should be given support? Who should be given something? And you, you'll know all this. Um, and so it was the uh, How the Other Half Live, The Secret Millionaire, and Fairy Job Mother. Fairy Job Mother is the most offensive one, but the link between the government, DWP, and Emma Jackson's charity is now proven. They use them both together, which leads, I think, to this where you know, Ian, Ian Duncan Smith says cuts to welfare make people feel more secure and promotes them on the media. But there is, there is a good bit. All our working class audiences hated these programmes. In fact, I'll say everybody hated these programmes. But our working class audiences connected across devaluation. So our black working class group from Rockley uh, actually loved Jade Goody. Now, I've got a whole lecture on Jade Goody because it begins with hate. The nation hates you, Jade Goody, which is in the sun. And it all begins with hate, but they all call her the ghetto rat, made good, and they like the quotes at the beginning. They think what's really good about Jade, she doesn't have to struggle anymore. She doesn't have to wake up every morning wondering how she's going to feed her kids. And they connect to all the people who've been completely humiliated degraded and devalued and I think that's really important because if we want to love society we need to look to the people who are doing the loving against all the odds all the odds and there's numerous examples across all my research projects and there's a lot of those so women in particular recognize the care of the condemned they really do recognize it they see through it so instead of accepting the symbolic judgment, and um, Jordan, do you remember Jordan, who's now called Katie Price? She was a subject of incredible humiliation when she first started. But all our participants, working class participants, defended her because of the care she gave to her son. So these things are very important. They see through the symbolic devaluation because they've been symbolically devalued all their lives, they've been subject to it. What's also really interesting in our last project, so many people were refusing to tell themselves. They refused to give account to themselves. They're refusing to be held to account anymore. And I think this is going to be a really interesting problem for sociology that relies on interviews. Nobody wants to be interviewed because interviews are a technology of uh, surveillance. So we need to be alert to these forms of evaluation in which we may be invested. And the reason I say that, because I think there's something really significant going on in terms of uh, class as mass still. The working class began with a historical deficit. It has uh, economic symbolic positioning. It has limits. It's born by an accident of birth into limits. 
It's economic values generated by exploitation. It's held to account by state institutions and its moral values generated locally through cultural connectivity. This is very different. If you read these across from each other, uh, very, very different. Inheriting advantage, positioning secures advantage and excluding others. Class is not about stratification. It's not a hierarchy, it's a relationship and they're held to account by performance into advantage. And the moral value is generated through judgment, not through being judged. Now, I've put this in because across all our groups in the Reality TV project, one thing came up, and it's come up in a recent project, that the middle class groups hated watching humiliation and exploitation, but then they got very angry when people get something for nothing. Now, this intrigued me because they're all living in London flats that are making something for nothing. My flat earns more than I do, you know, by the minute, just in capital growth. These are people who are living in flats that get something for nothing. Just literal capital growth. But they hate people who get something for nothing, like Jay Goody, who they think doesn't deserve. Deserving is still there. So they recognise exploitation and they can articulate it phenomenally well and they, they, they hate humiliation but then they get really, really upset at something for nothing. And for me, I think we need to be really careful when we hear that, see that, become really, really alert to it because it keeps coming out in research projects and it's, it's kind of, well, where is the value here? Where does the value lie? And so I think what's... What's really, really different and what's significant is degrading and upgrading in the same way as the economy works. And what I saw when, again, through two different projects, the TV and the welfare project, and I think uh, there's a really good headmistress in here who does really, really good stuff and talks about performance measurement, is that the people who produced the TV programmes were clinging on to precarious employment. Clinging on! you know, needed to make themselves famous through a sensational, horrific episode, their success depended upon the humiliation of others. In welfare, we see with A4E, success <laughs> depends upon the performance of others. And now we've got this kind of societies about those parts coming together where one is actually surviving and the middle class getting more and more cramped through judging, evaluating the performance of others through holding others to account. So, finally, <laughs> love society, hate struggles for value. In whose interests? We know in whose interests. I'd say all, all my life, all the research I've done, I can see really clearly in whose interests. And I think this really, really needs changing. It's got worse, it's more cruel, it's more selfish, it's more individualistic, it's more competitive. And the middle class are now being punished through their own performance in terms of how they hold others to account. So I'm not saying there's baddies and there's goodies. We're all socially positioned. And that's what's key. That's what society is. It's social positioning. We need to be really cautious about telling. Redemption telling and those narratives. They're used right across Europe and the Western world now. Prisons use them. Everybody use them. And it's about holding somebody to account. And you have to think, what are the possibilities for how they can speak that telling? Now, some are good. Some are good, thoughtful, reflexive, and some are really not. So we need to be cautious to that, I think, to those. And what are our investments in that? I think we have to be very suspicious of moral judgments of value and highly suspicious of systems of accountability. So I'd argue what society is, is a constant struggle for value and values. But we need to understand the conditions in which those happen. Relations are social. They make society. They could remake all those parts. They could send the force back because it is dialectic. It is, it is in a loop, the systems theorists say. We could change those institutions through various different social relations. They need rewiring. They really, really do. It's not working. So I think, how do we... And I throw this question out to you because you do loads of this stuff and I don't do it. I just do that. 
patterns of analysis stuff. How do we build value for the historically constantly devalued so that we can flourish and not always be in a position of defence? So that's it. I love society, I love people, but I hate the way they're positioned and made to be accountable and perform. Thank you.